Bruce, have you ever met Paul McCartney in real life? In real life? Yeah. No, but he's not dead yet. Well, that's really interesting you should say that. I mean, the reason I ask is because there are people that think Paul McCartney died back in 1966 oh, and the oh. Beatles replaced him with a lookalike. He's a replicant. He's a replicant. And th they say that the reason why I have this belief is because they look at the cover of Abbey Road and they say the clues are all in there. So, for instance, the Beatles are all walking across the zebra crossing. Paul McCartney's the only one in bare feet. And so apparently this means that actually he's, he wasn't alive at the time he was dead. He was also holding his cigarette in the wrong hand, right? And the number plate on the car on the cover of Abbey Road is 28IF, which conspiracy theorists claim means it, he would have been 28 if he was still alive, all right? So I think it's really, really interesting that, you know, you've got a whole group of people think Paul McCartney was actually, well, actually died in 1966 and the Beatles replaced him with a replica. I mean, why on earth they would leave clues on the cover of Abbey Road if they had have done that is beyond me. But there are people that really believe this stuff. It's crazy, conspiracy theorists. And this is all part of a, of a branch of psychology which is known as animalistic psychology, which is belief in anomalies, ESP, telekine telekinesis, um, spiritualism, Spirit, UFO, yeah, ghosts, UFOs, exorcism, ghosts, abductions and all that. Black magic. Where do, st where do you stand on all that? Have you, do, do you got any animalistic beliefs yourself? Or? Oh, I think, I think, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, uh, I've made a, made a living over the years, uh, dramatizing, uh, not, I don't believe in, uh, those kind of beliefs anymore but certainly uh you know when i was younger i was full of you know reading books about the occult and all the rest of it it's great stuff for lyrics and it's great storytelling stuff but uh no i am with probably what i imagine is going to be the line taken by our guest today on sky psycho schizo espresso um professor chris french that's right. Now, Chris is, he's Emeritus Professor of Psychology at Goldsmith College at the University of London, but he's also the director of the Centre for Animalistic Psychology Research. And he knows pretty much everything there is about all of those things, telekinesis, ESP, fortune telling, mind reading, all that kind of stuff. So I think without further ado, we should get him on. What do you reckon, Bruce? I totally agree with you. Before, quick, before we go off, I think he's probably. I think he's probably already seen this coming anyway. Uh, Chris, welcome to Psycho Skit. Deja vu. <laughs> Chris, now look. You know what? I've been animalistic psychology <laughs> right? Okay. Professor of animalistic psychology. Now I've been having a little look at what you. Uh, at, at, at what that uh, includes, and it is it, what a list it is: telepathy, ESP, psychokinesis, alien abductions, UFOs, uh, fortune telling, ghosts, poltergeists, spiritualism, conspiracy theories. I mean, but presumably belief in God as well. We'll come on to that in a minute. But um, I mean, where do you start with that little lot? I mean, well, I mean. <laughs> I, I, I guess, I mean, how on earth? You could start how on earth my, did you get... Start on my bookshelf. Go on, Bruce. Even, couldn't you? You could start on my bookshelf. <laughs> well, you so could. I mean, to Z, you just described it, you know. I mean, seriously, Bruce and I have been so looking forward to this, Chris, because, I mean, it really is. It's right up our alleys. I mean, I've got to ask, first of all, because I'm sure there's going to be people listening to this podcast who are going to really fancy themselves in your job. How on earth do you get started as an animalistic psychologist, mate? <laughs> I think the only uh, well, it started off for me, I and mean, I used to be I used to be leaving a lot of this stuff, you know, as a, as a teenager, um, even kind of through doing a kind of degree in psychology, kind of well into kind of early adulthood, I kind of believed in this stuff, a lot of it, 
Um, it was reading one particular book by a guy called James Alcock, a social psychologist, that made me mm. realise that there were kind of non-paranormal explanations for a lot of this stuff. And I found his arguments pretty convincing. And that's that was a big moment for me. You know, that's when I kind of first realised, actually, I find the sceptical arguments more con convincing and, and in some ways more interesting a lot of the time. Um, and then it was really kind of very much a kind of side interest, a kind of hobby. This was kind of going back to the early 80s. Um, I started at Goldsmiths in 1685. No, sorry, 1985. Just 1685. Like 1685. Now that's... It felt like 1685. <laughs> um, there was somebody I mean, there but... called Chris French in 1685. I think it was, <laughs> you've been reincarnated, have you now? Chris? Well, it wouldn't wouldn't at all surprise me. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> but uh, and I kind of just did a couple of lectures on this from a kind of very skeptical perspective, and the students loved mm. it, whether they were believers or skeptics. And it just kind of grew from there very slowly, really. And one of the reasons it was so slow was because it, for, to a lot of people, it, it felt a bit like this is not respectable. This is not kind of a, you know, this is not something a serious academic should be looking into. So for a long time, I had a kind of twin paths of research, some that was more kind of conventional, plus this stuff on the side. And then eventually I got to a point where I realised it was this stuff that really fascinated me. Mm. And so I kind of dropped the other stuff. And that, that's that's where we are now. Now that's fascinating. I mean, I, I, I think for for me the the subject is is divvied up into those people who um, believe that there is just a, an alternate existence of spirits, which is in some way impinging upon uh, this reality for them, and those people who would regard themselves as being a, a I don't know cult leaders or um, black magicians or people like people of the kind of like Alistair Crowley type mm -hmm. bent, and then the people who were interested in it, who were who had created uh, uh, a, a a world, a kind of a, a hodgepodge world of all kinds of bits and bobs joined together that they called a system, and they made claims that they could do things to people and cause things to happen to people. And that was very attractive for a certain type of personality that might be m might have felt disempowered by something or, mm -hmm. or, or, or felt it was a path to uh, enlightenment, which, of course, at the turn of the century, um, it, it was very popular. You know, I mean, you know, W.B. Yeats and uh, the guy that invented uh, uh, the tank, uh, Major mm -hmm. General J.F.C. Fuller, you know, yeah. Cambridge mathematicians, all of these people were interested in the golden dawn which was the kind of yeah. uh it was the bourgeois chattering set uh occult thing um led by a, a fantastic sort of uh complete charlatan showman <laughs> uh yeah. mcgregor little mathers you know and then you had this wonderful hmm. argument between alistair crowley and this guy two complete narcissists all having a go for you know the control of the domain of like 30 people that would turn up in a Sunday school, you know what I mean? I mean, but it's mad. It's, it's completely mad. It, and it has an influence on, on our culture, massively disproportionate to the, you know, the, the, any kind of power that these people actually really had in real life. But if you look at the people, I mean, everybody from Charles Manson to putting, you know, Crowley on the front of, uh, you know, of, of the beat of Sergeant Pepper and things like that, you know, um, Rasputin, that's another one, very similar kind of character. We're obsessed with these people. Um, so there's there's that element of it. But then again, there's the, you know, alien abductions, uh, astrology, mm. fortune telling, which are regarded as being um, more tame, you know, more acceptable well, yeah, for women's yeah. weekly magazines, you know. Actually, yeah. Chris, maybe it might help. I mean, what Bruce says is absolutely right. It is a huge, you know, it accounts for a huge swathe of like cultural and societal belief, this, uh, perhaps more than we give it credit for. So so maybe a way, to, I mean, I'm fascinated because I'm not, I don't really know the answer to this. Maybe, so you're, you're a professor of animalistic psychology, which is the study of anomalous beliefs. Then you've got parapsychology, yeah. Uh, and then you've got, you know, your, your, your ghost hunting kind of stuff. So it, to what degree is there an overlap between these or are they completely separate disciplines then? No, no, no there's a huge overlap. 
I mean, and it's it's to some extent, it's almost a matter of kind of labelling, to be honest. I mean, I, I refer to myself as being kind of a nominalistic psychologist because it's almost a way of saying I take a rather a sceptical approach to this stuff. You know, my working mm. hypothesis is to say, well, let's just assume that paranormal forces don't exist. Can we explain the kind of experiences that people have? But equally, I do spend some of my time directly testing paranormal claims. So I'm doing parapsychology. And equally, a lot of parapsychologists, they may focus more on setting up experiments to see whether they can find evidence that maybe telepathy really is real or precognition or all these other things. But they'll also do stuff that's just based on the approach of saying, well, let's look at what looks like it's psychic but isn't, you know, that we can explain in mm. psychological terms. So there's a huge overlap there. When it comes to, um, I mean, parapsychologists would typically adopt a very strict definition of what parapsychology is focused on. They would say it's it's ESP, extrasensory perception, and that comes in three flavours. You've got telepathy, direct mind-to-mind -mind contact. You've got precognition, knowing future events before they happen. Deja vu. Deja, deja vu. You know, oh, well, yeah, deja vu right. could come in. Could come in. I mean, the the, the other kind of two areas. One would be PK, psychokinesis, yeah. the ability, the alleged ability to influence the outside world just by thought. And the third would be evidence relating to life after death. And that's where deja vu might come in. Okay. Some people would see deja vu mm. as being evidence for reincarnation. Okay. You know, that you, the reason you've got that feeling of familiarity is because you haven't been to that place before uh -huh. uh, in mm. a previous life, you know. Um, but they would, they would just go for those three. So things like astrology... Most parapsychologists wouldn't see as being part of their discipline. You know, mm -hmm. they're going to use that very strict definition. Whereas myself, I am interested. I mean, you know, if if it's weird, <laughs> in a very kind of general and amorphous sense, I'm interested in it. I want to know. Kind well, this of book you're writing, actually, Chris, you're writing a book, aren't you? Which I think is coming out uh, next year, isn't it? Called the Science of Weird Shit. There you exactly. go. I said I'd get. Did, do you think that was an obvious plug there, Bruce? I think. I think, I think, I think that's a great title. Thank it you, is a. Bruce. It's a title. I wish I, wish I was almost writing that a, book. It's almost I a title read to it. die for, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great title. Um, it as, is. As I, I told Kevin before. I mean, it started off as a joke. I was originally going to call it "Why Weird Stuff Matters," which. I think, again, is a good title because for a lot of the time, people think of this weird stuff as being kind of, oh, it's entertaining, but you don't take it seriously. You know, it's the kind of and finally item on the news and that kind of stuff. Nobody really takes this stuff seriously. I mean, some people obviously clearly do, as, as Bruce has just been saying, but for most people, it's kind of weird. It's fascinating, but you don't take it seriously. It's not really part of your real life. Well, actually, I think we can learn a lot of really important lessons that, that mm. generalise beyond just the weird stuff by studying the weird stuff. So I was going to call it Why Weird Stuff Matters. And then just jokingly, I said to a lot of people, or I might just call it the science of weird shit. And without fail, everybody said, oh, I'd buy that. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, great. that's going to be the title. <laughs> so yeah. is belief in weird shit found in every culture? Is it, you know, if we were to go to, you know, I don't know, Aboriginal culture in Australia or, you know, Aztec culture in South America down the years, I mean, has, oh, has belief in absolutely. weird shit always been there? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's not a single kind of society anywhere in the world or at any point in history where what we would kind of put under that general umbrella term of kind of weird beliefs and, and weird experiences mm don't happen and so i mean that's an, an interesting you obviously get lots of cross-cultural variation which was it's absolutely fascinating i mean like one of my favorite kind of uh, illustrations of that is we're very interested in something called sleep paralysis which mm. is a pretty common experience in its most basic form you're half awake you're half asleep but you realize you can't move mm. and you know it lasts a few seconds and you snap out of it and you think that was a bit weird and you get on with your day but for a, for a smaller percentage of people they also get really terrifying hallucinations they might hear voices or footsteps and they can see demons and you know horrible figures and ghosts all sorts of stuff you get difficulty breathing, you feel as if someone's trying to kill you. You know, I mean, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, but you can look at different societies throughout around the world, or even going back in history, and you see the way they interpreted the same core experience in terms of their own belief system. 
And, you know, mm. that is absolutely fascinating. And sometimes to the extent it would actually influence the imagery of what they saw in their hallucinations. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, like in modern technological societies, it even plays a role in alien abduction claims. You know, uh, so, you know, we might not believe that there are demons coming and trying to have sex with us as they did in the Middle Ages. But aliens, on but, the other hand, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, the aliens. So yeah, that's that's possible. Yeah. You know? So uh, it, it, it's really interesting. And of course, and of course, I suppose as well because of the the in, the invention of the television and cinema and things like that, which is something which is completely unique to the last, uh, well, uh, two hundred, no, no, one hundred and fifty years, I suppose. You mm. know? Yeah, yeah. The photograph, the photograph. Yeah. And, and, oh yeah. And, and, and the, the the photograph and and realism. And that element that, um, you know, the, the expression, which is obviously complete nonsense, but the camera never lies. Yeah. Right. It's that, never been true. It's never been true. <laughs> but yeah. but nevertheless, we still, it's still embedded in our mind that yeah. it, may, it must be true. Fake news, all the rest of it, which is now incredibly sophisticated. But we've got layer upon oh, yeah. layer upon layer of conditioning that we don't even realize we're being conditioned. And this is not conspiracy theory. It's just the way we are conditioned because of the things we see that people yep. 500 years ago, 600 years ago, wouldn't have been seeing it. They would have gone and seen a gargoyle or some mm. something sketched in a yeah. book and gone, oh, that's scary. And that would have yep. preoccupied their dreams. So consequently, you see medieval you know, demons and things like that and all the rest of it. And, they write it all down in grimoires and, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, necromancy and all the rest of it. Because let's face it, if you go to a graveyard, you know, and have a couple of beers and sort of sit there on a spooky <laughs> night. Yeah. You know, you can imagine somebody coming up oh, going, yeah. Ooh, you know, I mean, the fact that he's been pissed and been lying there for like three, three, <laughs> three weeks is nothing. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> but 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 you no, know but, what I'm saying it, it, it's it's yeah no it's the it's the way we're conditioned now you know isn't that one of the the kind of I suppose one of the evolutionary arguments isn't it Chris of 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 why I suppose paranormal belief if you want to call it that um if kind of evolved in the first place we we have this desire to reduce uncertainty and for security and I suppose if if you know if in in, in the absence of any other explanation we we'll invent one won't we I mean is is it as simple as that or uh... Well, well, I think that's a, a huge part of it. I mean, because there, there is the kind of you know, the question of, well, you know, are our brains kind of pre-wired, predisposed towards certain types of belief? I mean, mm. if me as a kind of card-carrying sceptic atheist, if if I am right, uh, that might not be, but if I am right, and there are no spirits out there, you know, all these things are just kind of products of our own mind. But what, why are the beliefs so prevalent? Why are they mm. found everywhere? Um, yeah. And one argument is that in evolutionary, the, in evolutionary terms, you know, we, we it's kind of recognised pretty widely in psychology that we've got two different modes of thought available to us. One is, is called sort of system one thinking, and that's kind mm. of... For want of a, 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 a single label, you might call it intuition. You know, it's it's very it's it's very very quick decisions, no effortful processing, largely based on emotion and so on and so forth. And in contrast to that, you've got kind of system two thinking, which mm -hmm. is the kind of effortful step by step stuff that mm -hmm. you might use if you had to solve some kind of mental puzzle or whatever. Mm. And we probably rely more on system one than we realize, no matter how rational we might think we are. Um, now, what? Why is that? Well, if you think of it in evolutionary terms, it you've got a kind of uh, cost-benefit analysis to do. Yeah. You know, in, in our evolutionary history, we, we were often there were threats around us, and it made much more sense to have a cognitive system that came to a very quick decision that was usually right, mm. rather than taking a much slower system that might be right slightly more often, mm. but took too long. So we have a bias towards thinking, yes, there is something there. There is a potential threat. There is some kind of sentient agent out there with intentions towards us, you know. And and that kind of adds up to me. That, that does make sense, you know. So the rustling in the bushes, is it a saber-toothed tiger or not? Well, if you take too long to think about it, you might end as, up as lunch. So just assume that it is and get the hell out of there. Then you pass your genes on to the next generation. And, you know, that's the way evolution works. Bruce, have you, have you yourself, I, I've never asked you this actually, have you yourself ever had an experience 
that you would regard as as in any way paranormal or mystical that you you can't come up with with a rational explanation for yourself you ever had have you yourself ever had one of those no <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, but, no. But it, most people. What about what about you, Kevin? Yeah, I had one uh, which I can, which which, which um, a kind of sticks in my mind, uh, and that was um, I remember I was at school. My mother died when I was the age of uh, when I when I was age sixteen, and uh, I remember she was very ill in a hospice, and I was in London, and she was in. Birmingham in a hospice and I remember she was gravely ill and I remember waking up in the morning in my bed and I was gasping for breath as if I just sprinted 200 meters flat out and I remember waking up gasping for breath um, and then just kind of calming down and getting my breath back in bed and then the phone rang and my dad got up and picked the phone up and he, I didn't know what the conversation was. It was quite brief. And then he put the phone down. And then I remember him driving me to school that day. And I said, that was uh, news about mum, wasn't it? She died. And he said, yeah, I didn't want to tell you. Because uh, I think I had, um, I think it was on the on the morning of one of my own levels, actually. Um, right. and he said, I didn't want to tell you in case it actually affected your, you know, your exam and all that. Um, and so, but I, I, I remember that very distinctly. But of course, at the time, till I started studying psychology, that I always thought, wow, that's that's really powerful. Maybe that's some kind of evidence that mum's spirit was, you know, disappearing and trying to communicate, saying goodbye or something like that. But of course, I mean, I, I I'm sure you'll explain it, Chris. I mean, this is this is baseline stuff, isn't it, really? Um, I, I mean, the amount of times maybe I would have woken up and 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 thought the phone's going to ring any minute and it didn't. Well, I'd forget those. But the one time well, I yeah, woke up and thought that, that it did. Um, but that's the way I explain it. But I mean, what do you think? I mean, well, well on, I mean, on the other hand, I mean, you know, uh, crisis apparitions are one of the kind of most commonly reported, allegedly paranormal. Is that right? Events. Ah, okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, ah, okay. I mean, which will typically, you know, that will often take the the form of people not just having the kind of sense that you had that oh something's wrong sort of thing, but yeah. actually maybe even seeing a, an apparition right. of. The person, and then finding out that they kind of died at that moment. Now, yeah. again, the thing is, you know, as you said yourself there, Kevin, we just don't know how often people yeah. have those kinds of experiences. I mean, I can, you know, from my own personal experience, I can remember on one occasion waking up in the middle of the night when I, I was I was uh, working in Bangor in North Wales at the time. My partner at the time was in Leicester doing as a medical mm. student, waking up and seeing her standing at the foot of my bed. Now, by yeah. this time, I had become a sceptic, but I still I phoned, you know, and said, yeah. were you okay last night? Yeah. And she was. She was absolutely fine, you yeah. know. But yeah. if she hadn't been, if she'd have been ill or something like that, I'd have probably been pretty convinced it was a paranormal experience. But we just don't know, you know. For me, the way I now interpret it, Chris, I think, and um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a sceptic like you, is, is that, you know, actually... Um, I need we all the way our brains work is we need to make sense of what happens to us. We need to, you know, to make make sure that the world is is is, is ordered and patterned. And we 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 like to have this kind of, you know, knowledge of cause and effect, don't we? So I think I think the way I look back on that now is the fact that I woke up. Maybe I just had a bad dream, uh, which isn't out of the ordinary. The phone rang. It was news that my mother had died. And then what my brain did, it filled in the gaps and came up with this illusory correlation in order to make It'll sense be. of the two two totally independent events, actually. Yeah. Or, or that's, of course, that's you, know, you, were, you, you would have been stressed because your mum was gravely sure. ill, you yeah. know. And so yeah. the idea that you might wake up and kind of having a panic attack or something and then, you know, the timing just yeah. is coincidental to, to that extent. That's right, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, interestingly, you know, I mean, one of the big one of the big areas that I'm interested in is the whole kind of psychology of coincidence. Yeah. And I was kind of thinking about this earlier yeah. when Bruce was talking about the Golden Dawn Society, because mm. I actually I've already written about this in the book. One of the one of the things about the psychology of coincidence is that people are often 
kind of much more impressed when the coincidence happens to them rather than hearing about it happening to somebody else. Yeah. You know, we've all got this kind of egocentric bias there. Mm. Um, and I've got so one of the ones I've written about, which you you probably won't find that impressive because it didn't happen to you; it happened to me. But when I was a teenager, I I kind of I, I was listening to um, Hunky Dory. David Bowie album. This is a quicksand. Yeah, in the background, as I read a book called, uh, and, uh, it's, it, some editions were called The Dawn of Magic, some were called The Morning of Magicians. Lewis so sort Powell's? Of, uh, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Think, oh, it's a book now I'd look back yeah. on and think it was full of bullshit. Full of bullshit. But at the time, yeah, exactly. I was so into oh, exactly. it. Yeah, yeah, all of that stuff. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and just as Bowie was singing, I'm closer to the golden dawn, immersed in Crowley's uniform of imagery. Yeah. I read for the first time ever there on the printed page about the Golden Dawn Society. Okay. And to me at that age, <laughs> that was amazing kind of mind blowing mystical significance. You know? yeah. And now I look back and think it was, yeah, it was quite a neat little like, coincidence. But yeah. all the people who had listened were listening to that album endlessly as I was, you know, as well as reading that book, which is a real cult hit. It was almost inevitable that somebody would have that coincidence. Now, now I, I'm very similar to you, Chris. I mean, I, I, uh, I started getting into all the... Um, I actually found a copy of Alistair Crowley's Magic and Theory and Practice. It was in a school library, okay, which was pretty bizarre, you know, for a, for a 15, 14, 15-year-old 15 pulling that off the shelf, going, oh, hello, what's all this thing, you know? Um, so so I read that, and, and then... Um, and it, it was, you know, and, and I, I actually had a bit of go at some some of the little, like, like meditations and all the rest of it and everything else, and... I frankly didn't have the patience for. It. I thought this is a load of old tosh. I think I'll go and have a Mars bar, you know. But the <laughs> but it had a, had a much better effect on me, you know, like you know, sugar rush. But but uh, but in 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 later years, and it was fantastic stuff for writing heavy metal lyrics too. Um, and it yeah. was uh, you know, it's it's all brilliant because it's all it's the imagery is fan, it's fantastic. Absolutely, the imagery, yeah. the language, yeah. everything. It's yeah. grand. It's grandiose. It's Marvel comic world basically. Um, it's, it's, and and it was shocking to the older generation, yeah, which is brilliant, course, of course, you know, yeah. so, which is obviously a big bonus. But as I became <laughs> as I became one of the older generation, um, <laughs> I, I started to uh, to wonder um, uh, what it was about those things that mm. I found attractive. You know what it was, what what drew me to that, and what um what 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 kind of what led to my 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 fascination with with those things, and I think it's the same thing. You know, I used to when I was a kid, I used to play with toy soldiers. You know, like war gaming, but like really on a you know like we had rules and everything else. And I, I went to society, and then by the time I got to about sort of like you know w went to uni, I was just like, no. Nah go down the bar and try and get laid you know i mean and, yeah. and and so 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 your priorities obviously shift but in that interregnum you know between the age of 11 or whenever basically when you first become sexually aware the gap between the awareness that there's something going on down there but i'm not quite sure what it is um, but I know something's going on and it, you know, and that awareness... I'm still trying to work that out. What, are you still? Yeah, well... <laughs> still exactly. trying to work that out, actually. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, uh, that's another episode. <laughs> no, that's another yeah. episode. Well, sex yeah. is another episode. It's sex in yeah. another country, but... Uncle but, Bruce, Uncle Bruce will teach me about that. Oh, yeah. But it's like, oh, no, stop it, yeah. Uh, no, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. No, we're getting, the, we're getting to get into terrible Nico McBrain, <laughs> Nick, terrible Nico McBrain jokes. Yeah, oh, hello, love. Just sit on my knee and talk about the first thing that comes up. <laughs> right. And so anyway, yeah. yeah got, no. Ease but, off, ease off. But, um, but to me, looking back, the reason why all that is attractive is because it's about control, mm. which is the one thing as an adolescent you do not have. Mm. You don't have control over your environment. You don't have control over your sexuality. You don't have control over just about everything. You know, and, and you're in this netherworld of, I want to rebel, but I can't really rebel because there's nothing, because they'll lock me up. There's nothing that I'm a kid, you know. So you, you, you seek some element of control and these mythologies are an incredibly effective way of having an alternate universe over which you fantasize that you have some control. And that to me was why it was attractive. 
No, I, well, I mean, I mean, it's interesting you should say that because I think, I mean, I think control is really, really one of the very yeah. important concepts in this area. Um, to the extent that, I mean, a lot of the kind of research in this area is, I mean, I think it's interesting and it's casting some light on these kinds of beliefs and why they're main formed and maintained and so on. But some of it is kind of, oh yeah, but it's not too surprising. You maybe expect that. One of the results, which I think is is has been replicated several times, I think it's a genuine finding, is that paranormal beliefs kind of in general are often linked to reports of stressful childhoods. Mm. A traumatic childhoods, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, kids who uh, were abused in, in any way, kind of sexually, physically, mm. emotionally, or even just a long period of childhood illness. Mm. And I mean, obviously, this is not to say that everybody that believes in this stuff has a traumatic childhood or vice versa and so on. We're talking about generalizations here. But the idea that's been put forward is that we are, one of the things that we know correlates with paranormal belief and reports of paranormal experiences is something called fantasy proneness. Tendency to have this rich fantasy world that you mm. can spend time in. And the idea is that it's a kind of, you know, as you were developing, it was a kind of defence. You know, you, you didn't have the control over the outside world. You felt you needed some control. So you have a kind of fantasy world where you do have control, exactly as, as kind of Bruce is, is saying there. And then as adults, those people are often very, very creative individuals. You know, they've got fantastic imaginations. Um, but maybe sometimes they mix up what's happening in their imagination with what's happening in reality. And again, another of my kind of big interests is the whole psychology of false memories. Mm. And we know that one of the most effective ways of kind of implanting false memories in experimental situations is to get people to imagine stuff that they initially say never happened to them, but just imagine it, just think about it, and get them to repeatedly imagine it. And this often happens in therapy as well. Yeah. You know? um, mm. And you can end up then believing things, having very detailed memories of it, stuff that never actually really happened at all. I mean, and again, going back to this thing, sleep paralysis, um, I said before that, you know, different cultures, you will you get a huge amount of variation in terms of what people experience during sleep paralysis. I mean, some of it can be really just totally idiosyncratic, but there are also certain themes that occur again and again. And one of them with sleep paralysis is people often have the experience of some kind of old hag. I mean, in Newfoundland, they actually call it hagging. And there's a their old hag basically you know, uh, sitting on the chest of the person who's having the experience and, being, and, and trying to kill them, suffocate them or, or strangle them. Um, sounds, like a Netflix, and sounds like a Netflix series, this, you know. I it's mean. Well, yeah, no, I mean, the number of horror movies that yeah. have been directly inspired by sleep paralysis yeah, yeah, is, yeah. Is, is, is amazing. But, but people, I, I know from doing talks on this stuff that people will sometimes come up to me and they'll say at the end, of, first off, you know, I've had that and it's absolutely terrifying and I've never told anybody about it because I thought they would think that I was crazy. And so one really important message for me to get out is you're not crazy. It's this thing called sleep paralysis. It's terrifying, but it is essentially actually harmless, you know, but mm. can still be terrifying. But they will say, yeah, I got the old hag and I'd never heard about other people having it. And yet, you know, somehow that's the image that came forward. I mean, you think wow. about the kind of history of witchcraft and, you know, that notion of the old hag has been somehow, yeah. you know, even in Disney, evil, sure. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. So we're hoping you are enjoying our little chat on Psycho Schizo Espresso, but don't forget, we do have a special thing for you. If you want to pay four pounds a month, you can become a Patreon which means you get the unedited content, you get the extra long episodes, and we're even going to come up with some special stuff for you. Uh, you can become a Patreon if you want at www.patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, dot com forward slash psycho schizo espresso. And now, back to the music. I mean, when we talk about animalistic beliefs, do we include within that major religious beliefs, like in a monotheistic religion? So, I mean, we can talk about, you know, belief in ESP, telekinesis, all these kinds of UFOs, alien abductions and all that. But then when you start to include belief in, say, a Christian God or, or, or something like that, mainstream theological beliefs, 
um, then that is where I could imagine things start getting quite controversial. Everything um, you just described is in the Bible, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, uh, uh, you know hallucinations, uh, visions, yep. telekinesis, pillars of soul, part in the Red Sea, um, you know, uh, even ritual murder. Um, St. Paul, you know, Saint, Saint Paul on the, the vision on the road to Damascus. All of that, all yeah. of that, you know, jo, you know, jo, jo, the yeah. temptation of Job and Satan sort of going, go on, have, have, a, have a go. And this is why we came yeah. up, I, that's why I asked you the question early on um, in, yeah. in one of the episodes. Do you think God is actually a psychopath? Because he has all the characteristics. Yeah. <laughs> all those things that I have said actually are in the Bible, but... Actually, there's a double whammy here, because when you talked about, you know, traditional Christian morality of being nice to people, you know, not robbing, not cheating, not killing people and all that, that can quite easily exist independently of any deity. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. That, absolutely. That all those things can exist in a, in a totally humanistic framework as well. So it, it, it really is fascinating. I mean, it, the, the, the crossovers. But I mean, Chris, I mean, I mean, in terms of I mean, do we include like mainstream religion as animalistic? psychology well, well no it's really interesting i mean it, back when i first got into this stuff you know say the kind of early 80s uh there was a very there was a a, a real it was really noticeable that people in the kind of skeptical community for want of a better phrase would avoid touching religious issues too much uh but things have definitely changed i mean and, and really you can't because I mean, a lot of the stuff that i have interest in is you know like for example I'm interested in near death experiences. Well, for people who have them, they're often implicitly religious, explicitly religious experiences. Mm. You know, they think they've seen God. Um, if we're talking about people making claims of miracle cures, again, that you know that's got direct, it's directly related to people's religious beliefs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's so many of them. You know, I mean, what you know, mystical experiences of all kinds and so on and so forth, um, that you can't really avoid mm. actually touching on those, not more than touching on those religious issues. They they can often be the kind of quite central. So yeah. I don't try anymore. I'm, I'm quite happy to uh, talk about uh, those kinds of issues as much as kind of the non-religious stuff. Um, you know, I mean, for me... Uh, again, I very much kind of echo what kind of Bruce, I think, what Bruce was saying. You, you, I've got my set of beliefs, and I can give you my reasons for having the beliefs I've got. Um, but I don't, I don't really care. You know, you can hold whatever beliefs you like as long as it doesn't hurt other people. It's only when your beliefs start yeah. to impinge on other people sure. that I feel like there's there's maybe a reason then that I'm. And I think I think well, probably all um, three of us believe in that, but we would agree with that. Yeah, but, absolutely. But yeah. the problem is the, the problem is quantifying that. Uh, in some kind of legislative framework yeah. that, mm. that the whole of society exists. Absolutely. So yeah. try quantifying yeah. that in Saudi Arabia. No, yeah. it ain't going to work, you know. Um, yeah. It, yeah. And, uh, and again, that whole notion of kind of, you know, being tolerant of other people's beliefs, how do you cope with other people's beliefs when those beliefs themselves are intolerant? Which, uh, which most you know, of them are I mean, and, and again, fundamentally are. Uh, I mean, most... I mean, yeah. you know, Christianity, except, you know, I'm not quite sure how Christianity gets gets around the thou shall have no other gods but me. Um, and and then sort of is, you know, Marcus Welby's all cuddling up to, you know, yeah. the Quilliam Society and everybody else. I think it's great. Mm. But like, how do you get around that bit? You know, in your, which is kind of yeah. essential because th these are competitive religions. These are these are competitive, controlling uh, religions. Yeah, that the whole idea of the religion uh, was put together um, as a controlling influence by which the church could become as mighty mm. as the state, and in many cases it's, was until the state put an yeah. end to it, and now maybe it's being put an end to in the reverse way, you know. But um, Chris, Chris have you ever um, have you ever um, dabbled in um, in this area called neurotheology? Uh, so Michael I'm, Persinger. I'm, sure. Yeah. yeah. No, well, yes, to some extent, um, not not kind of directly as it relates to kind of religious issues. Mm. But um, again, for any of any of your listeners who don't know yeah. who Michael Persinger was, because sadly yeah. he passed away recently. Sure. Um, he had some very interesting, if very controversial views. Uh, he believed that uh, a lot of 
uh, mystical type, religious type experiences, as well as paranormal type experiences, including kind of seeing ghosts or being abducted by aliens and so on, um, that, that they were often hallucinatory caused by unusual activity in the temporal lobes of the brain. Mm. And he kind of, as part of his evidence in support of that, he, uh, he, he claimed that if you had these, this underlying uh, predisposition, electromagnetic, unusual electromagnetic activity in the environment could induce these kinds of hallucinatory experiences. And he developed a helmet with kind of solenoids on and what have you, and claimed that he could induce these experiences in susceptible individuals. Now, I mean, that's, a, that's the kind of theory that, uh, like, myself as a sceptic would love, because it's a non-paranormal explanation for ostensibly paranormal experiences. Oh, I'm Having said that, that... Well, that's why I brought <laughs> well, it up, Bruce, because I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm teeing you up for this, a go in the God <laughs> helmet, right? Yeah, well, that's the, right. I mean, that's... the... There were two Horizon programs that featured the God Helmet. There was one by Susan Blackmore many years ago. Oh, I know. Yeah, um, she's, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a great skeptic. Yeah, yeah. She's yeah. fantastic, Sue. Um, and you know, she she was there. Kind of, she tried the the God Helmet on, um, and within a relatively <laughs> short period of time, had a really, really weird, frightening, scary oh, experience. Cool. Yeah. And then a few years later. Richard Dawkins presenting a horizon. Yeah. He tries the God helmet on. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> no reaction Flat whatsoever. Line, yeah. Which may tell us more about Richard Dawkins and well, Sue Blackmore than it tells it, us it, about the theory. It, but, it, you know. went to my, he went to my school, so he was like he's 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 the he's the he's the poster boy for uh for Oundle skeptic biologist, you know, whatever he, you know. Uh, Richard Dawkins. <laughs> well, yeah. Wasn't one of the um, one of the kind of after effects of going in the God helmet, or one of the one of the the uh, feelings that people report is like a sense of being stared at or a sense of presence. So you have this kind of magnetic, low level magnetic stimulation of the temporal lobes, and you get this sense that someone's there with you, even though there's not anyone there. Well, that's yeah, that's what Persinger reported. Now. Yeah. I have to say that the, there's not been that much by way of independent replication of the results. Okay. And so, yeah, that's all. Now, what we actually did do something. There's a similar idea within the, this weird world that I inhabit of uh, that infrasound can also ha cause hallucinatory experiences. Infrasound, obviously, sound energy below the audible frequency range. Um and again, there is some kind of supporting evidence, but some people say there's not that much. Anyway, we thought this was a few years back. Uh, I was approached by a guy called Usman Hack. Basically, he does all this really amazing creative stuff. And we thought, if there is something in these ideas, wouldn't it be really cool to build an artificial haunted room where we play around with electromagnetic fields and we play around with infrasound mm. and we try to induce these weird anomalous experiences in people? We didn't really, you know, we didn't, we weren't anticipating that anybody would have a full blown apparitional experience, but could we kind of get people reporting a sense of presence or, you know, chills down the spine, that kind of stuff? Um, long story short, we, we 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 ran this study. We had seventy nine people spending fifty minutes in this specially constructed chamber, for uh, reasons of informed consent. You know, obviously it was all safe. There was no kind of mm. risks attached to it. But we had to say to people, you might be exposed to infrasound. You might be exposed to unusual patterns of electromagnetic activity. You might get them both. You might get neither. You won't consciously know which condition you are in. Uh, but just spend 50 minutes in there, tell us tell us what happens. We want to fill in some you know, questionnaires, etc. Um, long story short, we got quite a lot of people reporting unusual experiences, like a sense of presence, like dizziness, like, you know, recurring thoughts, all sorts of other stuff. Uh, when we analysed the results, it didn't matter what condition they were in. <laughs> didn't matter whether ah. the electromagnetic fields were on or off. Didn't matter whether the infrasound was on yeah. or off. What it did correlate with, the, the number of experiences they had, was their score on a particular scale that Persinger uses, the temporal lobe signs inventory. Uh, he uses it because he says it identifies people with these particular labile temporal lobes, but it's also known to correlate with suggestibility. So the most parsimonious mm. explanation is if you say to suggestible people, if you go in here, you might have weird experiences. Some of them do. And it doesn't matter about the... Uh, now, that was one, one experiment, you know. So you can't, you can't generalise too much. I was going to ask you this question because... Um, and you've actually kind of just touched on it there. 
So what there's within animalistic psychology, as we've been talking about, there are a lot of different things in there. You've got belief in telekinesis, you've got ESP, you've got spiritualism, you've got conspiracy theories, you've got UFOs, you've got alien abduction, you've got all of these things. It's a huge umbrella of different kinds of beliefs. So I guess the obvious question, and, and you kind of touched upon it there, as I said, is, 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 is animalistic belief, is it an either or, or are we all on a kind of a spectrum? of this. So so in other words, is somebody that that believes in say alien abductions more likely to believe in telekinesis and conspiracy theories and communicating with the dead? Or are these different beliefs kind of discrete and independent from each other in your in your it's, in your experience? It's kind of yes, it's yes and no, insofar as if you just kind of sampled the population as a whole, you would certainly find that people who believe in Alien abduction are also more likely to believe in uh, ghosts, telekinesis, etc., etc. However, you can get situations, obviously, where people believe in one but not the other. Yeah. I mean, it can be quite amusing at times to talk to people who are, you know, totally convinced in in terms of UFOs about, and they'll say, "Yeah, I mean, you know, we're not like those nutters who believe in ghosts." I mean, they're all crazy. Yeah. No, we're we're proper, right? You know, and equally, you talk to the people who believe in ghosts, and they say, "Yeah, we're not, we're not like those UFO nutters," you yeah. know, kind of. Um, and so you can get it, you know. And and the thing is, I mean, again, it's a multifactorial thing. You know, there's going to be the the kind of psychological biases or factors that might underlie, say, belief in psychokinesis, are not likely necessarily to be the same ones sure. that underlie belief in in telepathy yeah. you know the, 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 the but but so 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 there is a general kind of tendency and it might just be an openness to new ideas you know i mean which is which is a good thing but yeah. but so there's the general stuff but there's also specific biases as well but what fascinates me is that uh it, particularly with you know with with well with all of these aspects um m- many uh, extremely intelligent people over over the over the years um, have embraced them all fully, mm-hmm. um, and at the same time been able to function in a scientific career entirely separate. So, so one part of their mind it's almost like you know the schizo bit of our uh, of our podcast title. You know, it's almost like they've got part of their mind that they they just they abandon to random thoughts and things like that, whereas the rest of their mind, they apply. I mean, Lord Dowding, you know. I was going to say, Bruce, you were, you've told me about this guy, Hugh Dowding. Absolutely. He was an Air Absolutely. Vice Marshal, mastermind of the Battle of Britain, wasn't he? He, 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 he saved the free world by creating uh, the, the fighter control system, uh, by espousing radar, um, he was a fantastic administrator. Um, he was the very opposite of anybody. He was so yeah. stuffy down. He was methodical. He was regimented. And yet he saw spirits when he was in the Indian Army and before the First World War and continued then to see spirits of dead airmen. Um, and his mission was to bring them back to the life. He also, by the way, married a, a woman sort of like 15, 20 years uh, 25 years his junior, who was an anti-vivisectionist in 1943, right. and a vegan. And she believed in spirits <laughs> as well. And the two of them went off and had seances and did all this stuff together. And he believed in a hollow earth. And this is a but, guy, uh, th- th- this guy yeah. believed in a hollow earth, and yet he was still writing erudite papers, closely scientifically argued about air defence, right until the 1960s. Th- th- there there's seems, there's no... There's no limit to people of really quite high intelligence oh, yeah. that that yeah. compartmentalize part of mm. their life and attribute stuff to this. I mean, Conan Doyle, another one. Case well, yeah, yeah. I, I've been thinking about him a lot when you've been talking. Yeah, because yeah, he was obviously a genius. Yeah. No question about that. Uh, and yet, in many ways, one of the probably one of the most, world's most credulous men. You know, he... He believed in fairies. He obviously was a huge believer in spiritualism, um, and and we and you know we, what comes to most people's minds is that he was the creator of the most rational, 
detective ever as Sherlock Holmes, you know, and yet he himself was so different. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have to stop it uh, right there. Now, of course, we know what's going to be in what is actually going to be part two of this amazing conversation. Um, but uh, it's going to be not the same again. It's going to be lots of more different stuff. So a truly fantastic um, session with Chris. And uh, part two is going to be uh, coming up. Maybe we will talk about exorcism. I think there's people out there. I think there's people out there, Bruce, <laughs> that probably know what is what's going to be in part two, actually. They already know. They already know, so, yes. Yeah. Hello, folks. We hope you're enjoying Psycho Schizo Espresso. Just to remind you, it's a pod prod production. So please feel free to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcast. Uh, you can also reach out to us on email at psc at podprod.co.uk and follow us on social media on the hashtag Psycho Schizo Espresso. You can also, of course, become a Patreon by clicking on www.patreon.com forward slash Psycho Schizo Espresso, where you can gain exclusive access to unedited and unfiltered content if your brain can possibly handle any more of me and Bruce.